right, um, Carrie, do you want to go ahead and, and welcome folks? I'm going to share my screen and share the PowerPoint. Okay, um, good, good. I guess we're still in morning. Happy Friday, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Casey. I am the chair of the Delaware Continuum of Care. Um, we are hosting this session today. If you are not familiar with the Delaware Continuum of Care, we are a statewide community-based, most of you probably are members, but um, group that is working to end uh, homelessness in the state of Delaware. And we're really excited to talk today about this wonderful new resource coming into our state, uh, emergency housing vouchers, um, specifically for people experiencing homelessness in our state. Um, we received, three of our five housing authorities received in total about 120 of these vouchers, which I wish you know, we, could, we could triple it and, or quadruple it and still not have enough, but it's a great start. And we hope that it will lead um, you know, to, to, to more and more if we can have a good model and um, you know, get these vouchers utilized quickly. So before I start, um, before I turn it over to Rachel, I would like to introduce some of our housing authority partners that are on the Zoom. Uh, Ray Fitzgerald is the new executive CEO, executive director of Wilmington Housing Authority. So I see that he's on there. Hi, Ray. Um, you know, really glad to have you and really have, uh, um, you know, really happy to have your leadership um, at the Wilmington Housing Authority. Kathy McGinnis is also here from Wilmington Housing Authority. Um, we, I, I didn't see Chris Whaley, but um, Chris Whaley's from Delaware State Housing Authority. He might very well be on. Um, so we've had some calls with him and discussions with him, as well as Robert Rizzo, who runs the Newcastle County Housing Authority. And I actually work in Newcastle County and um, can wear that hat as well um, as I manage the housing division for Newcastle County. So glad to have our housing authority partners there. We've also been working closely with our DV community, domestic violence community, um, in looking at how to utilize these vouchers. And I see Marcy Rizak, who is um, on the Zoom call, who is also a member of the Delaware COC board. So, um, just excited and really, the, the really also really awesome thing about this is that one of the requirements is that the housing authorities work closely with the COC, which, you know, again, you know, we, we collaborating and coordinating um, together is going to serve our population the best. Um, so it's, it's just a really exciting new program. We are lucky that we only have one COC in the state. So we, we can become, you know, I feel that this, this is the kind of thing that, that can make Delaware really shine because we work so well together. Um, and so just really, really, really excited that we're getting these vouchers and that um, we'll be able to utilize them to help our most vulnerable in the state. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel and who is the executive director of Housing Lines Delaware. She started, but you know, she's, she's our fearless leader at Housing Lines Delaware, and um, she's gonna give an overview of the program. And um, so thanks, thank you very much. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so our agenda today, um, welcome and some introductions um, of, uh, specifically of our public housing authority partners that are here with us today. So thank you for that, Carrie. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the local proposal. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of HUD's requirements around the emergency housing vouchers generally so that folks know what they are and what we're talking about. And I'm going to tell our, um, some of our public housing authority folks here that if I miss anything or there's anything that you think that I should have said that I didn't, please feel free to chime in. The goal here is to keep it broad um, overview for folks um, and then to talk about what the proposal is for how, as a community, we think it would work well to use those vouchers in Delaware. Again, as Carrie said, this is not a lot of vouchers, but it does have the potential to make a lifelong significant impact for 120 households in our state. And we wanna make sure that, that we're able to accomplish that. So um, I'll talk about the local proposal that's on the table. Um, and then uh, we'll have some time for question and answer and feedback, and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Um, this is a work in progress, but this is an opportunity to have that conversation together as a continuum of care, um, as homeless service providers, as public housing authorities. 
So the target population, um, this is defined by HUD. Um, these emergency housing vouchers have to be used for folks who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, stalking, human trafficking, or folks who were recently homeless and have a high risk of becoming homeless again or housing insecurity. Um, under the emergency housing voucher program, um, HUD requires that the um, public housing authorities accept referrals through the local coordinated entry system in that community um, for those vouchers here in Delaware that is centralized intake. HUD also requires that the public housing authorities accept referrals from victim service providers for households um, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence um, that may not have access to referrals through the local coordinated entry system, which again in Delaware is centralized intake. Um, we also have to have a memorandum of understanding executed between the continuum of care, the victim service provider organizations, and the public housing authorities that outline those relationships and roles and responsibilities for the administration of the housing vouchers. And some services are expected to be provided to households that receive those vouchers as well. Um, so emergency housing vouchers do come with some funding that can provide some assistance in addition to just the housing subsidy. So for households, people, families who um, are issued a voucher, there is some funding available to help with things like security or utility deposits, arrearages if necessary, um, moving expenses, um, essential household items, help with housing search, um, all of that, the specifics of how the, those funds will be used, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, public housing authority folks, um, will be determined at the local level. Um, but there are some funds there that are available to help with those things as needed so that folks can move in um, and get stabilized quickly with their voucher. So there have been a number of meetings with the public housing authority folks um, with us here at Housing Alliance as the continuum of care lead organization and the administrator of centralized end date here in our state, as well as some representatives of the victim service provider community to talk about how we think it could work best here in Delaware to get these vouchers to um, the eligible households. Um, so some of the things that we've talked about are wanting to use these vouchers to get people leased up as quickly as possible. Um, to have households be able to retain the vouchers for as long as possible. And to be able to show success. So one of the things, there have been a lot, I don't know, if some, some of you may be plugged into this and participated in them. There have been a lot of webinars um, about the emergency housing vouchers from all kinds of federal partners, HUD, um, national advocate organizations, and trying to help communities think through how to best use these resources. Um, and one of the things that has been made pretty clear is that even though this is not being considered a demonstration program by HUD, the goal here is to, we wanna be able to show, and we've been told it's important to show um, that this can be successful, that housing vouchers targeted specifically to the homeless population, um, that HUD is thinking of this as let's see if we can make this work in a partnership between our housing authorities and our local homeless assistance systems, our continuums of care. Um, and so the goal is to show success that we can do this, we can make this work for people, we can get homeless or at risk of homelessness households connected quickly to these vouchers and leased up and stabilized in housing um, so that we can make the case, and by we, I mean us here in Delaware, but also across the country, that this is a resource that should continue to be funded in the future. Um, so a large part of what we are thinking as well is let's make sure that we do this well and can be successful. Um, so here's where we are and here's what we've talked about so far in our, I guess I'll call it an ad hoc committee, <laughs> um, in terms of where we think we can best use, how we could best use the emergency housing vouchers here in Delaware. Um, and again, this is a proposal. So the idea is that they would be targeted to households, both adult only households, couples, singles, and families with children who are, and we have these three categories, literally homeless and being referred to centralized intake or to rapid rehousing through our centralized intake system. 
um, enrolled in rapid rehousing, but lack the ability to stabilize due to a lack of income um, and are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. I'm gonna talk about each one of those three uh, a little bit more. So uh, literally homeless households, again, it could be singles or families with children, but the idea here is that any household being referred to a rapid rehousing program through centralized intake for a period of time, again, there's only 120 of these, but for a period of time, each one of those referrals would be paired with a referral to an emergency housing voucher. So the household um, has been identified as homeless, has been, has been prioritized according to the continuum of care standards, and a referral would be made both to a rapid rehousing provider to serve the household, um, to move them quickly into housing, help them stabilize, but they would also get referred for an emergency housing voucher. So the housing search process would include, we have a voucher, <laughs> um, this person's rent will be paid. Um, and so the idea is that that person is coming with some services that are already being provided through the rapid rehousing provider, and that that voucher is a supplement to the assistance that person is already gonna get to move in and stabilize in housing. Um, there would be details that would need to be worked out about the process. How does that referral to the voucher work? What type of paperwork would need to be completed and submitted to the public housing authority to ensure that that household would be able to access that voucher, right? So there's some details there um, that we don't have answers to yet, um, but that's the, that's the idea kind of big picture. Um, the second group of folks enrolled in already in rapid rehousing. So we know and we've heard from a lot of our rapid rehousing partners that they have a lot of households that they're working with who have not been able. So in rapid rehousing, um, for those of you who administer it, you know it, but those of you who may not might know, the financial assistance is temporary. And so the goal is to help people increase their incomes to be able to take over their rent on their own. Um, and there are a number of households that have a really hard time doing that um, and maybe have not been able to do that for any number of reasons. Um, and so we also wanted to make it possible for rapid rehousing providers to reach out and ultimately like apply for a household that they're already serving to be able to be referred for an emergency housing voucher. So the idea here is that it's a household that a rapid rehouser has been working with um, they know them, they've gotten to know them a little bit, they've been working with them for at least three months or more. Um, and this household either has not been able to get into housing because they do not have income um, or don't have enough income. We know the rental market is really tight right now. Landlords um, in a number of cases have the ability to be very selective about who they house. And so some rapid rehousing providers are having an even more difficult time getting those folks housed unless they have income first or maybe this household's already been placed in a unit um, and has been working with the provider for quite some time, but given the circumstances, maybe that person is, um, has a disabling condition and is you know, on SSI or SSDI. Um, maybe they have very poor or little work history. Maybe they were homeless for a long time. For whatever the reason is, um, they would be severely cost burdened, meaning paying more than 50% of their income towards rent, and housing costs um, if they were to lose the financial assistance that the rapid rehouser is providing. Um, so we wanted rapid rehousers to be able to help those households get access to these vouchers. So the current vision is that there would be a very simple way for a rapid rehousing provider to say, hey, I have this household, I have this person, I have this family. Um, they would be severely cost burdened or they can't access housing. We've been working with them. This voucher would really make a huge difference and allow them to stabilize in housing. And then the third um, is folks fleeing um, or attempting to flee domestic violence. The idea here is that there would be a certain number of the 120 or so vouchers set aside for this population specifically and that referrals would come directly from victim service providers details for, again, how that process exactly would work are yet to be determined. So currently there is a process happening um, between the public housing authorities, the continuum of care and victim service provider entities um, to execute this HUD required MOU that will outline roles and responsibilities and target populations. Um, and we understand that 
if this proposal were to be implemented, there would need to be some planning to figure out the details of the process, make sure all of the partners and parties involved understood their roles um, and who was doing what to help these households get connected to the vouchers. Um, I will also add that um, I believe, and we, you know, the, the housing authorities, I'll let um, maybe Devin um, can speak to this a little bit more um, if, if I don't say this right, um, but there are some, the additional services funding, there is a recognition that the ability to pair households and get households connected to these vouchers and leased up and stabilized may um, have a capacity strain on some of our providers in the community. And there is a desire and an ability to try to get some additional service dollars to those organizations. Devin, did you want to add anything or Carrie? Yeah, I was just going to say something really quickly. I, I, I failed to mention in, my, in the beginning, Devin Manning, who's really been heading up this whole effort for DSHA. Um, and, you know, her, um, you know, I think, again, a real benefit for the state is that we can collaborate so closely, um, the housing authorities can work so closely, as well as having the leadership of Delaware State Housing Authority. Um, you know, Devin, you know, got approval from HUD to allow us to do a statewide MOU because it makes no sense for the three housing authorities to do individual MOUs with the COC. Um, and, you know, has drafted that MOU, you know, keeping us on task so we can utilize these vouchers as soon as possible. So Devin, I don't know if you want to add or Cindy too, through DSHA, um, you know, your leadership with this is, is really um, commendable and I thank you for it. Um, so I, before, you know, I don't know if you wanted to add anything about what Rachel was saying, but I, I failed to say that in the beginning, how important DSHA has been in this. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> that, that's, that's very nice of you to say. Um, very kind of you. And I actually, I, I don't have anything really to add to what Rachel was saying, just to, um, just to kind of echo it, I guess, is that we recognize that this would add more strain on the providers who are already pretty, pretty stretched as it is um, assisting the clients and the households that you're already working with. Um, so there is an opportunity, as Rachel said, with some of the federal relief packages that have come through to support staffing costs associated with assisting EHV households. So we're exploring how to do that, how best to do that um, in coordination with the other PHAs as well. So hopefully we'll have more details to, to share on that soon. Thanks, Devin. Um, so that is a pretty uh, quick overview. Um, we are very happy to take questions and feedback. So I'm gonna actually um, hand it over to you all um, for any questions or thoughts or feedback that you have and we will do our best to answer any questions. Rachel, I have Hi. a... Oh. Oh, um, Crystal, was that you? Yeah, I was Go just ahead. gonna ask, um, uh, like, are these like section eight vouchers? Like they're gonna be permanent and pay for their rent continuing years or do they have to be, you know, able to pay a certain percentage? Like what kind of vouchers are these? I mean, there's 120 going out. What, what, what are, are, are they similar to section eight? Are they, you know, what's the stipulations other than, I mean, obviously they have to fit one of these criteria, but you know, are, is this paying 70%? Is this going to pay a hundred percent? Devin. Yeah, um, so general uh, general housing choice vouchers, or they function the same as general housing choice vouchers or you know, okay. to a section eight vouchers. So it is a uh, 20, I believe <clears throat> tenants pay 28% of their adjusted monthly income towards the rent and the rest is subsidized by HUD. As far as the timing of it, um, they're, yes, they're permanent, but they're also, there's a time limit on the program itself, on the funding source supporting the program. So after I think it's September, 2023, the households that have their vouchers can keep their vouchers, but if they leave the program, we cannot turn their voucher over to a new household, if that makes sense. So whatever is issued and leased up by September of 2023, that is what we have, and we will not get any more uh, PHV funding to support ongoing vouchers. Okay, thanks. Um, Sarah, it looked like you, where's, where'd Sarah go? Sarah Cha Cha? I am, yep. yep. So my question is for people who are having trouble finding homes for other reasons. So if they have a past eviction, 
um, they can't use the voucher, right? Because they can't even get into a place. Is there anything that we have for those people? Because if they're homeless, um, they're not. I think some of the clients that we work with, because I work with Jen Parsons, she sends people over to stand by me. And some of the people that she sends over just have other problems. Like their credit is like just slashed or they have um, past evictions. So they can't even find a place where people will rent to them. Um, that's a problem through the court system. I know that, but is, is there anything that we can do for them or is it just, you know, they're lost in the, the gray it, area? That That is such a good question. And um, I think some, and Devin, correct me, it, it, you know, there's some, there's some funding. Um, I think it was the 3,500, correct? That can go towards convincing a landlord, um, you know, to, to, to take a chance. I mean, I, I think... That's something that, um, you know, I can talk to Newcastle, for Newcastle County. We've started to hold monthly landlord Zoom meetings just to talk to invite landlords for hearing about what a great, you know, taking a chance on someone because of the subsidy, we're really an actually good business deal, right? So that I think that onus is going to is going to fall on some of the housing authorities as well as some of the providers that are going to be helping to, to create um, the incentive to make this something that entices a landlord, even if someone has a previous eviction. I mean, I, that's the biggest challenge. And I think that's why these additional resources are being tied to the voucher, whether it's a landlord mitigation fund, whether it's um, a bonus, you know, something to say, you know, it's always to try to get, uh, convince a landlord to take someone that might have credit or a previous eviction. I know it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, so part of the 3,500 can in, indeed be used for landlord recruitment um, strategies. And um, I'm going to ask Cindy DeKine if, if you wouldn't mind, because there is an additional source from DSHA that can supplement that activity. I know we were talking about it just recently, but would you mind kind of like expanding on, on that a little bit for folks, the landlord recruitment resources? Sure. Um, I think I saw Jen on the, on the line, but we have a landlord, a pilot landlord mitigation right now under Home for Good, um, which is another one of our programs. And uh, it's basically um, providing a guarantee um, to a landlord that if um, up to $2,000 in additional funding um, for, uh, for landlords to take a chance um, with households who have those barriers of credit, criminal, um, landlord issues, um, and the landlord has to, you know, agree to it. So does the resident, um, and the rapid rehouser as, as, as it is right now. Um, and basically it's a guarantee. Um, so if there are issues after the household moves out, um, there's funding to take care of those. Um, and that's something that we're definitely considering to, add to this program um, with either the $3,500 that HUD provides or with some other resources that we have. So we definitely want to expand that. And Housing Alliance was, um, you know, they reviewed the documents and some of the things that we do um, for that mitigation, but it would be great to, um, to do the same thing for these vouchers. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Paulette, do you have your Hi. hand up? Hi. I do. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, piggybacking on what Sarah had said, I work in reentry um, here in Sussex with the way home. And we have a difficult time, very difficult time connecting with any of these resources. Um, I think maybe two clients were able to take advantage of the community resource centers um, programming that was there for rapid rehousing. So is there a way to target when you were going through the target populations, we don't fall in a lot of those areas. Um, they're homeless upon release. They don't have any money. Uh, they do get the money, but then they don't have the money for the security deposits. Um, they, uh, there's not a lot of inventory down here which is another major problem. And of course you all know how high pricing is, especially down here. So as a, pro, you know, um, as a resource for the community for reentry, we have a hard time fitting in. 
um, any suggestions, um, any way we could partner to make it a little bit more expedited for these guys and gals that are coming out of prison? Well, I'll just say for these specific vouchers, if the folks are homeless, mm -hmm. I know it's after release and the goal would be not to release folks to homelessness. Um, if folks are homeless, um, getting them connected to centralized intake um, to, or to a homeless service provider in the community that does the housing uh, need assessment, um, the VI SPIDAT tool would be a way to get that person in, you know, I hate, I hate the word line, but it's kind of a line, in line for one of these resources through the rapid rehousing referral process. Um, so I, I'm happy to have a more detailed conversation with you about that piece of it. Okay. Um, but that, I mean, that's kind of how like community-wide, regardless of whether someone's coming from, regardless of where someone was, if they are homeless, they are potentially eligible for the resource through the coordinated process that we um, use. So, Rachel, this is Cindy. Um, I saw on the chat that um, Paulette Weston Neighborhood House has a pilot program that we funded through Home for Good for reentry assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and that is for security deposits, um, other deposits, some rental assistance, although it's temporary. It's not like a Section 8 voucher. So Doreen Conte is the contact there that's running that program. And actually, they were a little slow to get off um, the start on this pilot uh, because of COVID. Um, so please contact West End Neighborhood House. Um, you know, and Doreen is the contact there because they at least have some temporary funding that should help um, your clients. But is, isn't West End in Newcastle? Yes, but those, um, the money is statewide. So they don't, they, they, their funds are for statewide help. Um, the other piece of this too would help if probation and parole were given um, training um, or, and I'm sure you've tried, but um, including them because there's a second wave of homelessness and reentry. It's not just upon release because upon release, they might be staying with their sister, their cousin, their neighbor, their good friend, and then they outstay their welcome. And the second wave of homelessness is usually about six to eight weeks after release. Were you able to hear that? I think I froze. No, I, we, I heard that. Okay. Yep. All right, so when once they are out and placed and then that second wave comes, um, especially if those who max out, they don't have probation. So they really fall between the cracks, but it would help if, if probation was looped in or the in-reach coordinators were looped in in some meaningful way because they're the ones Um, Paulette, I think you did freeze up a little bit there at the end, but I think I think we might have got what you were trying to say, which was making sure that folks who are providing the direct services to those folks at the time that they um, become homeless, whether it's immediately or a few weeks after when they time out of some of these temporary places, um, to know about that resource and be connected to how to access it would be important. So it sounds like talking with the folks at West End to coordinate that might be the best next step. Okay. Um, um, does, it, does anyone have Doreen's email or phone number that could go in the chat? I do. I'll post it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Yep. Um, Jen, or no, sorry, Laura, you had your hand up first. Sorry, it's hard to keep track. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay, Rachel. Thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning. I just, um, from a two-on-one perspective, I wanted to know, I know that you had stated that we have to go through central intake um, for referrals. So this is, um, so our processes in regards to fielding those homeless inquiries, uh, do you want us to promote the program or, you know, to let them know um, from a caller perspective that there is this opportunity or do you simply want us to refer them over to central intake and then they can do that because we are consistently getting the calls for homelessness. 
Yes. So, well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask kindly that we don't promote the program widely. Um, okay. The reason being that everyone is in need of housing, like the number of people in our state in need of housing assistance, far, 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 far in the thousands outstrips the number Correct. of vouchers. And so I think if we, not that we wouldn't tell people about it, not, I'm not trying to be secretive, but I don't think it actually helps folks um, to be calling and asking for a resource that um, most people are, are unlikely to get, quite frankly, um, because it's such a, so limited in number. Um, so I think following your current process, um, sending people our way if they report that they're homeless, um, and we will continue to do what we do, which is talk to folks and um, make the, the referrals through our, our provider network. That's fine. That I just sense. wanted, I, yeah. I figured as I figured as much, but I just wanted to verify. Um, yeah. And secondary, how quickly is the turnaround time in regards to application and actual um, receivership of the voucher? Um, do any public housing authority folks want to address that, that part of the process? So once someone applies, once someone is referred to and applies for a voucher, um, is there a anticipated turnaround time that folks can expect? I know this is a technically a new voucher program, but it's similar to others. So I didn't know if you would have an answer to that. I think from when we receive the necessary documentation, it'll only take probably, I don't know, three to five days to actually assess someone's or determine someone's eligibility for the program. Um, and then most of our voucher briefings are happening remotely now um, over the phone. So there's some, and I'm speaking on behalf of DSHA, um, WHA and, and Newcastle County may have different processes, but <clears throat> we have a pre-interview packet that people have to complete and a voucher briefing packet that folks have to um, uh, complete and before they receive their vouchers. So the whole process could take one to two weeks um, after we get the referral. Okay. Well, so actually the hardest I, part is gonna be finding the landlord, you know. Great, Devin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and so folks, they should start the housing search process, I would say, you know, as soon as they submit their application. Because, and, and Rachel, I think that's a, a component built into the referral process, right? Is you want to find people who are like already connected to a landlord that already have a lead on a place to, to live for, right? Well, so in, so for some folks, um, for the folks that we're just referring first time to rapid rehousing, they're probably going to have to be starting that process post referral to the rapid rehousing provider. Um, but the idea is that they would be engaging in that housing search process with a voucher in hand, which in theory could help them more quickly access a unit. Um, because it, to go to someone and say, hey, I actually have a way to pay, pay the rent um, versus when rapid rehousers sometimes have to go to landlords and say, this person doesn't have any money or a job at this point, but we're going to help them. Can you take a leap of faith? You know, the hope is that that household coming with a voucher um, will, will help actually expedite the process, even though it definitely does not solve it, as, as we just talked about when, when we were talking about Sarah's, when Sarah asked her question. Um, the other thing I'll say too is the um, process of getting all of the application documentation in itself can take some time for folks depending on what they do and don't have handy. So um, what Devin was talking about in terms of time frame is once the public housing authority gets all of their required documentation. I know sometimes it can take some time for people to get the documentation needed to the housing authority. Okay, will you be sending us the PowerPoint presentation? at the conclusion of this. Yep. Yep. Happy to do yeah. that. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yep. Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, was wondering if they're going to be allocating so many vouchers per county. How is the choice going to be made per county? Um, as you know, as the only rapid rehousing provider in Sussex, um, I'm sitting with about 130 some clients um, in motels um, that I'm either currently paying their rent um, or they're looking. So um, I'm really concerned about I know the whole state is in need, but I don't want to cause further homelessness if we can provide those ones that just need that voucher just to stay in their rental. So I'm just concerned about how we're going to allocate those and what the credentials are going to be to see the Sussex get the voucher over Kent or Newcastle. 
Um, so each housing authority was allocated a certain number of vouchers. Um, to, so the 120 is a statewide number, but the vouchers are issued to each housing authority. So DSHA, Wilmington, and Newcastle County. Um, Devin, do you have those numbers? <laughs> I'm calling, I know I'm calling on you a lot, but do you have the numbers of how many were allocated to each housing authority in front of you by any chance? Off the top of my head, I want to say DSHA got 38. Um, Carrie, Newcastle County got 39, but I think you're going to get some more, right? And then the WHA Wilmington Housing Authority, I believe got 42 or 43, but please Ray and Kathy jump in. But HUD has already made this determination. They came up with their funding methodology. So, and DSHA obviously covers Kent and Sussex. So it's 38 vouchers split between those two counties. Um, some PHAs uh, refuse to accept their awards. Um, and so HUD is going through a reallocation process. So there is a possibility that we will get more vouchers further on down the line. And I think, I think Newcastle County was already notified that they are going to be getting more. Oh, Carrie says we might get 21 more. That's a lot. Okay, awesome. Um, we have not, DSHA has not received notification of that yet, but we are hopeful. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions, thoughts, feedback? I don't know if this question was asked already, but do you know when these vouchers like will be available for people to start applying? Um, so I think the answer is we don't have a specific date on that, although I, anyone from the housing authorities, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the goal would be to work out the details of the proposed pro of the process and be able to start referring folks to um, the vouchers in the next like two months or so, right? So HUD is supposed to make the funds available to us in July, um, and then we're supposed to have our MOUs fully executed by July 31st. So ideally, we would be able to start accepting referrals August 1st. Hi, um, this is Anna Conway from Housing Stabilization Unit with Division of Social Services. Um, I was wondering, once this becomes available, when we have clients that may be good candidates for this program, are we going to be making new referrals to centralized intake? And in those referrals, are we going to indicate potential eligibility for this? Or is this pool of clients going to be selected just from families that are already connected with the rapid rehousing providers? Um, that's a really good question. So um, the kind of two parts that come through centralized intake are the people who are actively being referred to rapid rehousing. So we manage a prioritization list of people and families who are homeless in Delaware and eligible for rapid rehousing. A rapid rehousing provider tells us, hey, we can take a referral for a family in Kent County, or hey, we can take a referral for a single in Sussex County, whatever it is. And then we go to our priority list and make that next referral. Um, and so the idea is that the voucher would be attached to that referral. Anyone who's in a hotel or motel is considered literally homeless and is eligible to be considered for rapid rehousing potentially. Um, it's a matter of having that person connected to centralized intake, assessed with our assessment tool, and then they would get placed on that priority list. Um, so all of those folks are meet that criteria of literal homelessness, um, they would just need to be connected and on the rapid rehousing priority list to potentially be referred to rapid rehousing and therefore mass matched with a voucher. So that's not folks that are already enrolled. Those are new referrals going out to rapid rehousers um, for folks. But then there's that other population we talked about of folks who are already being served by a rapid rehousing provider that could benefit from that voucher, which would then free up the rapid rehouser to take another household, right? Um, once that person, we know they're going to have their rent paid, maybe they're, they're stable in other ways, and they can kind of come off the caseload and take another household. So it's going to be both people who are already being served and new folks. Does that answer the question, Anna? Uh, yeah, and then the other population of clients that are like imminently homeless, or have the 50% or more housing cost burden, are they also going to be referred through centralized intake? 
Well, so that population of folks was folks who are already enrolled in rapid rehousing. So they already have, they're already in a unit. They just aren't able to take over the rent um, and aren't, aren't, be, aren't able to stabilize in their housing for that reason. And so the idea is that the voucher then can get some, can get plugged into that household um, and prevent them from, from becoming homeless again. Would that also apply to the participants in the homework SRAP program, the one-year voucher? Because I know that we have a significant amount of people whose vouchers is going to be ending on June 31st that fit that exact criteria. They have, you know, very minimal income, weren't able to increase their income throughout the year, um, you know, and are facing homelessness again as a result. Okay. Um, Devin... Um, you're going to get tired of hearing me say your name. Um, people who are in homeworks are considered rapid rehousing clients, right? Or no? I'm so sorry. I get confused a little bit about homeworks. I'm going to have to punt it back to you anyway, um, because they, you know, they they didn't come to us through centralized intake. They came through a separate pipeline. So I don't know if they would be. I mean, yes, technically, I think we we would consider them to be rapid rehousing type clients, but because they didn't come through. The rapid rehousing like established pipeline i don't know I, I don't know if they would qualify for a referral through through hat um anna that's a really good question and i think we are going to think about that yeah that would be great because that was the population i thought of immediately when i saw these vouchers um because most of these people we helped them apply for you know the public housing list the tax credit site um, or other types of SRAP, and either their name was not selected yet, they exceeded the occupancy limits for those sites, or whatever the case may be. That's that's a. I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you, Anna. We will um, figure out how to we'll make a decision around that and work that into to what we do. Um. Oh, Devin, did you have something to add there? You looked not like you were. Yeah, not really, just something okay. that I wanted to, I'll, pro I'll need to follow up with you probably after this because um, a lot of the homeworks families too, me, uh, they meet the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness, not the HUD definition of homelessness. Mm. But I think I think McKinney-Vento is captured for EHV as well. I just need to double check and confirm. Okay. So that should okay. be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, so my question, and I hate to bring up old news, <laughs> But how do you guys um, decide what goes, like how many vouchers go to what county? Because population is about even between Kent and Sussex and then Newcastle, but they are receiving the majority of the vouchers between Newcastle and Wilmington. Again, so I have made that determination for us. Um, it was their methodology. And actually, thank you for mentioning that again, because we did get some clarification in the chat. So HUD awarded the SHA 38 vouchers. Um, WHA got 43 and Newcastle County got 39 with the possibility that they might get 21 more, but Carrie says they have not received official notice about it. Um, but that was HUD's determination um, as far as how many vouchers to award each of the PHAs. Okay. I was just wondering who made the determination because it just seems, <laughs> again, I'm, re I'm trying to raise the red flag for Kent and Sussex because we're, it, I feel like we're the stepchild of the state. You know? I think there's some HUD reps on the call uh, on the webinar. So if you want to <laughs> feel some pressure. Yeah. I would I would imagine it's and you're from Code Purple King County, but I would imagine some of it has to do with finances. And since there's a lot of corporations that are um, done in Delaware, majority of them probably have um, home bases in Wilmington in that area. And so financially, that county probably has a lot more um, pool than maybe our Kent and Sussex. So I think, you know, it's just one of those things, too, that we don't see all the, the red tape maybe on our end. In yeah, the I think the methodology is based on population. And 50% of the state lives in Newcastle County, including Wilmington. So that Perfect. kind of makes sense that 50% of or more of those vouchers are going upstate. Thank you. Yeah, but they're getting 80, 75 to 80% of the vouchers. That's that's why we asked. So you guys are getting, or Newcastle and Wilmington is getting 80% of the vouchers and we're getting 40 um, for both counties. It just seems a little uneven. Yeah, and it also has to do with our public housing authorities. Um, you know, there's only three of us and we only represent Kent and Sussex. So 
there's there's a method to their madness. So again, if if the HUD folks are on the the call, you guys can uh, opine here as well. But I'm from Kent and Sussex too, so I feel the pain. I just I put the notice the uh, the HUD notice in the chat because they do explain their their funding methodology. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that to see how they came up with the awards. Sometimes they take into account not, and I don't know if they did on this case, but sometimes for these types of awards, they also take things into account like poverty rates and that kind of thing. That's good. That might mean we're doing something good in Kent Sussex and for Newcastle doing something good too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to look at some of the silver lining somehow, you know. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have any other questions, comments, concerns? Just saying, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I know this is very difficult um, work to be doing, and I, and you know, and I'm new to it this year, especially myself for Cool Purple. So I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate all of you all. You all are heroes in your own respects. And, you know, I, I find it a little bit uh, ironic that you're the one that said that. Um, the work that you and your team have been doing this year is quite incredible. So I'm going to give it right back to you, Ennio. I'm taking it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> undoubtedly, undoubtedly it saved lives this winter. So thank you. All right, if no one else has anything else, um, I'm gonna say farewell, have a great weekend. Um, if you think of anything, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we will be, um, once the processes and um, protocols for these vouchers are finalized, we will communicate out. Thanks, have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. <laughs>